Robert Lipsonelli says you are making a statement by showing up your two feet today, so that is the beginning. Thank you. Um, and I'd also like to thank our esteemed panelists here for joining us and for sharing their knowledge with us this afternoon. Um, it is definitely my pleasure to introduce to you the following, uh, Brenda Nunes. She is our global property specialist with Keller Williams with the Nunes uh, Group Real Estate, and she's our ADU and DADU expert. Um, thank you, Brenda. Brock Friedman. Brock is the managing partner with Kirkland Capital Group, and he is our prop tech and finance expert. Thank you, Brock. Uh, Leslie Reed, she is a real estate broker with Windermere, and this is one is near and dear to my heart. She is our condo conversion expert. So thank you for being here. Brett Waller, he is the director of government affairs with the Washington Multifamily Housing Association. Um, and he's our multifamily expert, so again, thank you very much. So I'm going to start today with um, asking you all the first question, and then we can share mics. Um, but my first one is, everyone's talking about affordable housing. Um, it seems to be the buzzword of the year. Um, what does affordable housing mean to you? When I get feedback on social media, everyone automatically makes assumptions of one thing. So I kind of wanted to pass the mic and ask you that one question. What does affordable housing mean to you? Across the board for anybody that's not a billionaire or a multi-millionaire, I don't know, I don't think Jeff Bezos is in the room here. I think it really affects each and every one of us. Uh, in, in the sense of, particularly here in Seattle, when we talk about middle market. Now that can range anywhere from a new tech person coming in right out of college or a couple of years out of college and considering, hey, I wanna get married or start a family or move in with my partner. Uh, kinda like to put down roots here. And all of a sudden you look around and nothing's affordable to important people in our society, the fire men and women, police, and other people that we rely on. You know, first responders, I heard something scary about there's no first responders that can afford to live in Seattle. To me, that scares me. Uh, so I think these are very, very important issues that touch on housing affordability to me when I look out there. For me, it's pretty much the same. I would, but to make it simple, I would say that people can afford to live in the communities that they work in, and they don't have to commute two hours to get to a job. You know, it just creates a more quality of life when you're when you're not spending all that time in the car. I'm gonna say what they said, but also add to it that a teacher shouldn't have to work more than one job to live in their community. Um, people should not have to drive four hours every day to go back and forth to work. It just makes no sense at all. Going last, I get to kind of echo everyone's statement. I think just broadly speaking, it's uh, really pain a reasonable amount uh, towards your housing costs every month that doesn't burden you in a way that you can't pay for transportation or other of life's necessities. So um, nationally, we recognize that to be 30% of your income, about 30% of your income. It's funny, when I um, get feedback on social media, our community for affordable housing is very active on social media. The first thing that I get questions on or people comment on is, there's all programs for people who are homeless because they automatically equate homelessness with affordable housing. And that's not, and yes, that's a, a, a huge issue. I believe it's a 2% rent increase equals 4,000 homeless people on the streets with every 2% increment in rent. So yes, it's huge, devastating. However, there's a whole gamut. It affects every single one of us. It's not just the homeless, it's the missing middle, it's upper class, it's our government, it's our cities, our streets, everyone. So it's really cool that our experts here, to me, um, that you recognize that. It's not just the homelessness problem, that's the, seems to be the, uh, not the cause, that's the result. Um, so let's start with Brenda. Uh, my first question for you is, what is the difference between ADU and DADU? We don't think this, is this mic working? I guess it is now. Okay, so first of all, Seattle likes to be different. In the rest of the country, they pretty much call it all ADUs. 
Danus, which people love to use in Seattle, are detached accessory dwelling units. So just the difference between is it part of the house or is it detached from the house? Which that's a good good thing to know. You can have one or both in certain situations. Um, so we all know that we need more. It makes sense for home ownership. It makes sense for people building their individual wealth, and it brings potential rentals. Correct. Um, what are the two top challenges uh, facing us with ADUs and DADUs here in our regulations in the Greater Puget Sound area? Okay, I, I think the first thing, and, and I came from teaching a real estate class of 75 real estate agents on ADUs and DADUs, and I was reading through all the critiques, and the biggest critique was that we didn't give more city, municipality specific information. Well, the reason for that is everybody's laws are, yeah, everybody's laws are different. You could spend a day just reviewing the city, what each city is doing. There's no predictability to it. I would say that's the biggest challenge. The second challenge, I mean, probably don't look at your neighbor here, but the second challenge is not in my backyard. And that's kind of an irony to a dadu. But there are so many people that don't want to see that added density in their neighborhood until, I might mention, until their, their kids can't afford to live and they have to drive four hours to see their grandkids. But really, it's, it's a problem, and we've got to get people to understand the relationship between having more dense housing and being able to live close by in your communities. Brenda, one question for you about that. Sure. So is anybody trying to uh, get with the different cities or counties? Absolutely. And, and, and then sort of at least try to yep. unify? Yep, and, the, and the really there's two different, there's two different schools of thought. Some municipalities are like, whoa, 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 we don't want you telling us what to do, state. The other side of it is saying, please put the regs in place so we're not the bad guys. If you do it as state, so there's a lot of talk, and this year I would say, or last year, for the first time uh, that I've been around, I've seen chambers, the real estate community, the building community, and affordable housing all get together and say, how can we make this work? So I think we're taking steps in the right direction. You hit on something that kind of sparked me. Um, when you said, people say not in my backyard, they're NIMBYs until it affects them directly. Absolutely. So give me a scenario how this affects me and you and everyone in this room, because we we are the missing middle. Well, I can give something. I, I can tell you something that's really personal. And by the way, I do live in Bellevue, and Bellevue happened. What I, what is so interesting about Bellevue is they have master builders is in Bellevue. The realtors are in Bellevue. The city of Bellevue does not allow backyard ADUs. Uh, they just don't. And builders building new houses cannot put them in. You have to have be a resident that has lived there for three years. So a personal story, um, my husband's parents, my husband's an only child, and yes, if you met him, you'd know it. <laughs> but his parents moved out to the northwest from Massachusetts I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago to be near grandkids, etc. Well, everything was great. They had their nice apartment in downtown Bellevue, and then my father-in-law died. At the same time, my kids had gone off to college, and the frat house was empty. So we turned the frat house into a mother-in-law. Now, we didn't go through the permitting steps because I don't think they would have allowed it, um, my mother-in-law could eat with us, so having a full kitchen wasn't a big deal to her. But in 90% 90, 90 of the fit, it was an ADU. And I can say that for me, at drove it home that if, if that happens to my family, it probably happens to every other family 
and by God, we should be doing something about it. So my husband, before she moved in with us, was every day having to go take her to the grocery store or to fix something or you know just constantly doing things. Well, the 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 trade-off for me was I got to get a dog, and guess what? My dog has company every day. He gets to go down to Grandma's house. <laughs> it it all it just makes a better community. The reason, one of the, one of the three thing, criteria for our home purchase this year was that we wanted space for rental income, but we also wanted a space because we have aging parents, and it does not make sense to me after watching my grandmother pass last year and watching the last five years of her life of my mother and her other sister, the only two that lived in Washington State, take care of her on a daily basis. It was expensive. It was a lot of work and it was devastating not being able to be there and provide for her. So we chose a home in Tacoma, which is very forward thinking. And I think the city of, the city of Seattle can take a little lesson from Tacoma uh, because we can do both. We can have an ADU inside the home. We can have it detached in the yard. So turning to Brock, um, he and I have had kind of discussion on the side. Um, he has a, a little side gig called Prop Tech and it's, short for property technology. And so what I was interested in was, how am I gonna pay for this? So he said, there are ways. So for the uneducated like me, like myself in the room, can you give us a one minute simple explanation of what block blockchain technology is, if that's possible? Sure, I'm not sure if I call it a gig. Uh, I'm also the regional chair for the Blockchain Real Estate Association here, so. I, it's more of just association similar to Fiopsi. Uh, so let me first start out. Blockchain is not crypto. Okay, I know that there's a lot of people who think Bitcoin, blockchain, same thing, right? Think of blockchain like the internet. And on the internet, you have a lot of different applications. Crypto or Bitcoin being one type of crypto is it like an application that's built on top of it. There are a lot of other applications and a lot of other things that you can build on blockchain technology. Uh, now, it's a mutable digital ledger. So I know I probably said a couple of words that maybe you understood one out of those, but let me kind of explain a couple things out of that. But it, it, essentially what that gives us as a tool is a way to push forward in a new way, financial transactions, identity tracking, document tracking, titling and conveyance, materials traceability, there's a lot of different things here. But immutable basically means that it can't be changed or it's very, very difficult for what's, what's already on there, on the ledger, to be changed. And ledger, I just mean you know, you know, a list of transactions, okay? Or a list of things that have happened. And with it, that's a peer-to-peer, -peer, so there's no trusted intermediary necessary. Uh, it's distributed, so a lot of people can have the same copy, and then those all, all those copies update at the same time. And sometimes you'll hear people calling it DLT or distributed ledger technology instead of blockchain, but really they're the same thing. It increases trust and decreases risk and decreases chances of fraud. So there's a lot of good stuff here, but I probably still didn't explain to most of you what exactly am I talking about, right? Okay, so let me try this, and I'm going to read from my notes because this is a new explanation even for me, and I think it might work here. So let, let's, let's take this. So uh, Sarah, let's say you, a node, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw in a couple of words there, uh, have a transactions file on your laptop, okay? And, and that's, a, that's a ledger, okay? Two different accountants, let's say Brenda over here. Oh, that and, be scary. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and, and, and someone else here, uh, basically, once you want to do a new transaction, we'll call them miners, have the same file on their computer as well. So it's distributed, right? Okay. And, then, and as you make a transaction, your computer sends a message to everybody else that has that same file. Online. Yeah, online. And basically says, hey, is this transaction okay? Do I have the funds necessary? And your, your two accountants then look at that transaction say, okay, is that legitimate or not? And the first one to verify that, verify funds, let's say, for a transaction, then they're actually paid or rewarded a fee, very, very small fee, 
okay, to, to verify that transaction. And then they validate that inform everybody else that has that file that, hey, that's a correct trans, trans, transaction, that you have the funds there. And because of that, then everybody updates that file at the same time and verifies that, yep, we all have the same thing. Now, if someone doesn't agree, then there's mechanisms to go and check that again. So hopefully that helps you understand how everybody sort of gains consensus, that's another word you'll hear in the blockchain community, of all, everybody on the network having that file and being able to update. But what that really does is allows quite a few different uh, options in really reducing, now you can go back and see how it maybe reduces risk, reduces fraud, if everybody's got the same thing, and, and also reduces intermediaries that now charge a lot of money for being that trusted intermediary. That saves money. Okay, so how can this technology help in the fight for affordable housing? Well, let's say two, two ways. So first, if we can lower friction. I mean, everybody knows here who's gone through a real estate transaction just how much friction. So many people, organizations, have their finger in the pot. And I'm not necessarily one of those technology maximalists. I have a background in finance. Uh, as well as technology that are going to say, well, we're going to disintermediate everybody. No more brokers, no more this, no more that. No, that's not going to happen. But what may happen if you don't watch it is that those who don't understand and leverage technology as it comes down the pipe, you're going to be without a job. That's the scary thing. So it takes people plus leveraging that technology. So if we can really lower that friction, uh, lower transaction costs, lower administration costs, enable better, faster, less expensive, uh, let's say co-buying, uh, lower title insurance costs. So that lowers that. Okay, on top of it, so let me give you an example of that. In England, actually, where honestly a lot of the setup is very similar to here, they actually this year did a parallel fully on the blockchain transaction for buying a house. Okay, when I say parallel, it's because it's not yet necessarily legal or able to do that whole thing on the blockchain. But by executing it in parallel, they're able to see, okay, how fast, where could we go? They estimated that with that, not only could they lower the cost of that transaction by 75%, that's pretty significant. They could also get to a, a period where they could close that transaction in one day. Can you imagine that? Close the transaction in one day. Amazing. One more thing uh, is, and, and, and one, of the com one company here in the US is working on that property and they've got some of that going. Uh, another place that I see where it could help, especially the affordable housing area, is really tapping home equity. Now, up to now, the only way to tap home equity was to go get a home equity line of credit, right? And now all of a sudden you gotta pay more every month because you've tapped that home equity line of credit, whether it was for emergency <laughs> funds, whether it was to improve your property, whether it was to go out and buy another home, whatever, whatever the reason was, you were faced with a high monthly payment for that. Now with blockchain, a company called uh, Quantum RE does what's called a shared equity release. So what you're basically condoizing or sharing a piece of equity in that house and that there's investors coming in and buying that, and instead of requiring you to pay a monthly payment for that, they take a stake in your house. And when you go to refinance or sell that home later, you, you've given them a share in that equity. By then, though, your house has gone up, you share in that equity, you've got some of that, they've got some of it. You're, you're, you know, you're doing basically a piece out of how we do commercial financing, and we're adding that to homes. Now you don't have to pay that monthly payment. And you're not on the line either if that house happens to go underwater. So to me, you know, those are some of the very cool items where, well, I could take equity out because I need it, but I'm not faced with a payment. I got someone else that's sharing the risk and sharing the upside. That's amazing. Okay, so what are the two challenges that you see that are facing us with blockchain and how it pertains to home ownership? Are there... uh, well, a lot, of, a lot of people, once they look at blockchain, uh, they, they instantly look at our, our titling and conveyance system. And that's certainly a area that is very ripe for innovation. Uh, there are some other countries that are way ahead of us with that because they have a national title and national conveyance. Uh, here it's, a, it's really challenging because as we all know, government moves slow and county governments move even slower. Yeah, so that's going to be a challenge. And on top of that, any type of tech shift, you know, we look back and we forget how long it actually took to go from internet, what was that again in the 90s when I call people up or vendors up and say, hey, we want to be on the web. 
what's the web? You know, I mean, and that went on for a number of years. It took 10, 15 years for people, your average person, to get on the, the, the internet. And I think it's going to take the same for, although not quite as long. It, it takes a long time for people to get new technology out there and get it in a place where it can be used. Kind of like me trying to get my loan officers to do social media. <laughs> Just do it. Okay, uh, Leslie. So, switching gears a little bit. This is something that I am super passionate about. Um, I personally am a proponent of condo conversions. I believe they are quick, they're an easy solution for more affordable housing options, um, but there is still some major stigma surrounding conversions of the past. Um, problems with them being poorly constructed, having defects, um, which kind of changed our legislation because of it. Um, can you tell us simply in just a few minutes how condo conversions work today, and if how they've been improved from years past? Well, first of all, there haven't been any measurable condo conversions in the last 10 to 12 years, just because of the um, condo regulations changing, the financing changing. Um, I would say the stigma around the bad inventory back in the mid 2000s was probably a product of the boom market where um, people who really weren't fit to be developers, it was basically the people who are doing bad flips now, right? They're just putting lipstick on the pig. And um, so there were those people doing those, but that was because they could, because the market was so um, starving for inventory. I think in a normal market, I, and I think that there are good quality developers who will do good quality work. So I, I don't think that people should be scarred by that. And that shouldn't go into the future necessarily. It's it. hard for us to forget the past. And there weren't that, I mean, there were, as a percentage, I don't, I think the percentage of, of bad conversions was actually probably pretty small, but, yeah, let's do that. Okay, so what are the two top challenges facing us with condos today? With conversions? conversions? Well, the good thing is all of this apartment construction. I've been watching this saying, those are going to make great condos in the future, because as the rental market um, plateaus, you know, part of the problem is that it's cheaper and it's more profitable to build apartments right now, and part of that's because of the high um, liability insurance that developers have had to take. They changed that now, and time will tell how that goes. But I think the biggest um, challenge right now is going to be finding buildings that apartment owners will sell to condo conversion developers that are um, going to be affordable enough that there's the margin to do it. And then I would say the second would be just ramping up, um, you know, there's construction labor shortage. So that would be the two big, big problems. Yeah. Um, okay, so give me a scenario of how this, of how conversions can affect you, me, everyone in the room, the middle class. I think the good thing about conversion product is that, um, and like Troy was saying, those buildings exist. They're already in neighborhoods where people are working. Um, there's plenty of new construction condos downtown Seattle, so I'm not really talking about that market. Um, but if you think of some of the outlying areas, um, you know, Kirkland, uh, Redmond, Edmonds, Mount Lake Terrace, Linwood, Shoreline, there are, you know, apartment buildings, and converting those really is affordable housing for people in those areas. And you open the market to a segment of people who probably aren't able to buy otherwise. You know, single people, um, single parents, older people who have never been able to buy. And condos aren't always an economic alternative to a single family home, too. Some people want a condo. And so you basically open up housing in areas where maybe it is more um, rentals or single family. There aren't condos. There are a lot of areas that don't have a lot of condo, but there are apartments. So it would open up you know, the multifamily type housing in those areas. Uh, we would have purchased our condo that we were renting in downtown Kirkland. Um, right across from Kirkland Urban was gonna be great with Google going in there. Would have been, you know, our long-term goal was we'd end up renting it out and buying somewhere else. Yeah. Would have been a great rental for us, right? Yeah. Um, but with the HOA fees and the litigation surrounding yeah. who is responsible for that in Washington State, you know, it's very tough. Yeah. It just wasn't economically feasible for us. It just yeah. wasn't a smart investment for us. So, yeah, I mean, it's really interesting. Okay, so multifamily, you mentioned multifamily. Brett, when most people think of multifamily, they think apartment rentals. 
Um, can you define what multifamily housing is to you? Yeah, definitely. I mean, multifamily, we've seen what we've seen in the past 10 years is large multifamily um, communities being built across this area. Um, and that's what people think. But I, I could really consider multifamily to be um, anything that shares a common wall, um, any housing units that share a common wall. So that could be a duplex, it could be a triplex, a fourplex. Um, these all are critical pieces of the housing ecosystem that you know, play a, a significant role. And, and often those duplexes and triplexes are much more affordable um, to rent than um, a brand new larger apartment building. Even. Yeah, so rentals, right? Yeah. So what role do rentals play in the affordable housing scenario? Well, certainly, I think in Washington State, as we've talked about today, um, having a, a majority of renters, and, and particularly in Seattle, having a majority of renters affordable, uh, rentals play the most critical role in affordable housing because that's what exists for folks. Um, I think looking more broadly, you've got uh, a large number of Americans who don't have $400 to for an emergency in their uh, bank account. Um, and when you look at trying to buy a home, whether that's a condo or a single family home or something else, um, that's a barrier to, to buying that home because without that down payment, then they, they either got a <coughs> massive mortgage payment or no mortgage payment at all because they just can't, they don't qualify. Uh, so <coughs> rentals have become the affordable housing. Uh, in in this in this jurisdiction. Right. Okay. So, what other type of multifamily varieties are important options in solving the affordable housing crisis? I think I think everything. I mean, we we've got to um, we talked a lot about earlier, you know, incentives to, to build um, more housing units. But I think we we've, we've got to have those duplexes and triplexes. Um, we've got some barriers to that right now um, with zoning restrictions that prevent duplexes and triplexes and that, that graphic that talked about the missing middle was phenomenal um, to show the potential of what, what could happen. Um, we used to have that, I, I like to call that exclusionary zoning um, because uh, you've got cities that create single family neighborhoods like Seattle that's 70 plus percent single family zoned um, and that that, that prevents uh, a duplex, a triplex. Um, we've made some headway with the ADU legislation and DADU legislation, I think, and that's also a critical role. Um, you've got to have housing options for the variety of people that need and want to live in Seattle. And sometimes people will only ever be able to rent, and that's okay, but they need to be able to afford it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so give me a scenario of how this affects me and you and everyone in this room. Yeah, I mean, I think a, a personal story of my own is uh, we tried to buy a house in 2016 in Seattle, um, the Seattle area, and we started in Seattle and we're getting uh, outbid and outbid and outbid. So we went to the east side and we're like, oh, great, we can have a yard, the dogs, and it's going to be fantastic for the dogs to not have to be on a leash all the time. And uh, we found a, a really great house in a really great neighborhood. We did a tour of it and had mold coming through the first floor. I'm like, well, this is going to be expensive. Um, and uh, the house, uh, they ended up lowering the price, and the house still sold for 150000 more than the asking. Um, we ended up buying a house on the peninsula uh, as a vacation house because we, we wanted to invest our money in housing in, in a piece of real estate. And so now we have this beautiful uh, weekend house on the peninsula, which has created an amazing quality of life. Uh, and when we go over there on Fridays, uh, it's really amazing for me to see the number of people that ride the ferry uh, to Bremerton. Um, it is absolutely packed, and it's not just the fact that we're redoing the Coleman Terminal. I mean, you really have to get to the ferry terminal about an hour early just to make the afternoon ferry. Uh, even with a 200-car boat, um, you've got to have that opportunity. So I think you know we're looking at. Um, you know, just from an industry perspective, looking at the peninsula, Bremerton, Bainbridge Island has really great opportunities uh, with fast ferry and other opportunities, uh, transit opportunities to make make it easier for folks to enjoy a nicer quality of life and not have to worry about sitting on I-5 for two hours and 15 minutes every day. <laughs> uh, exactly. And, you know, just to share mine is my husband's going to retire next year. Um, we wanted a good quality of life. We wanted living and working in Kirkland for you know 20 plus years. 
um, it's a lot, and it gets overwhelming. And so we kind of feel like we live on the San Juan Juans where we are in Tacoma, but in the meantime, I had to drive to qualify. So I'm one of those people, and that's really what spurred my passion about this, because it affected me, and it, it's kind of crazy. Once, once you get there, it's phenomenal. Once you the get there, you feel like you're on vacation. <laughs> but but that, it's that cool down period of it getting is. out of that traffic and, and not being upset that you sat from federal way to five for 45 yeah. minutes. <laughs> <laughs> when it should take you 45 minutes to get here. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so final for all of you. Being that you are the experts, what do you think is the single most important solution to solving the affordable housing crisis and why? And I'll start with you, Brock. Um, I don't think there's a single thing. Uh, in looking and in, in talking with a lot of people, it's actually going to take a community of people that work with both government, private, technology. Not any one of these solutions can be missing and we will solve this problem. It, it won't happen. Uh, and and if, you, if you allow me to talk about one more thing that I think is kind of important that wasn't addressed here is is the idea that we have a lot of people, particularly with the boomer generation, that wants to, what they call it, aging in place. In fact, in yesterday's Wall Street Journal or today's Wall Street Journal, there's a whole article about that, that the whole uh, rise of the retirement communities, that they're actually having trouble att uh, attracting the boomers who want to stay in their own home. But uh, as as you talked about, yeah, that, that you, well, what are you going to do? You're, you're now an empty nester. Mm -hmm. So I was having a conversation yesterday with uh, the, the co-founder of CoBuy. Well, you know, this isn't just about buying. What about this kind of housing affordability? You've got uh, someone who wants to stay in their home, but you've got lots of room. You've got a lot of younger couples or a younger person who wants to move in. What about this kind of condoizing, and this is where you, know, you can use block, the blockchain, there's someone out there doing that now, to sort of split that house. It doesn't necessarily have to be done in a with city code, it can be done in the kind of condo way where that's put on there, and now there's a, a split ownership of equity. Now you've got, you've solved two problems. You've, you've allowed someone to now age in place, you've got someone there for emergency, watching your dog, having fun, and you've given maybe another couple or a younger person a chance to have start to build equity in a home in a, in a nice area of, of town. If you know a good attorney for that to do the condo work, let me know. Mm -hmm. It's expensive. Well, I think that's where you, you're seeing the rise of, again, technology. Right. With like Kobi, and I know there's another one that have that whole, that whole process already done in a very tech forward way. And they've got everything ready, you just go online, you fill out what you need to do, and, and all that stuff is sort of done. So you don't have to go to a lawyer saying, explain to them five times what you're trying to do, and they're like, well, oh, research that, and now you're facing like a $5,000 legal bill. You know, you can do this kind of thing in, in, in a couple thousand dollars. That's great. Um, I think, I mean, it's gonna kind of say the same as him. I think it's just gonna be a lot of little things happening over time. I think um, for condos and condo conversions, I think, again, just, um, changing the laws to make it to where developers and lenders and um, you know everybody involved in those can get comfortable to jump back into the market. So, yeah. I think it boils down to communication. I think we need we need to have everyone out there understand the impacts of not having affordable housing and we've got to be able to show them what's in it for me because that's that's what they're looking at and we have to be able to drive home the transportation how every how everything's interconnected transportation education you know i don't know if any of you have heard this but in california they've had to shut down some public schools because they can't get teachers and I, I think we have to have the conversations, we have to figure out how we can let the rest of the community that doesn't do this on a daily basis understand the impact of the not in my backyard mentality. Because that's, dri that's driving everything. 
I have to I mean, I agree there's no silver bullet. I think um, one of the biggest factors is the political will to make tough decisions and not to make a decision just to try and be reelected um, from politicians. Uh, and that starts, from, for me, that starts with zoning. Um, we've got to remove exclusionary zoning barriers, and that includes um, oppressive impact fees that, uh, frankly, that cities enact to exclude housing options in um, different jurisdictions because that just creates, that exacerbates the problem, um, whether that's a large apartment building, um, ADUs, um, or the duplexes, I think, you know, we've, we've got to take a holistic approach. It does, it's going to take a village to solve this problem and we've got to have, just have open minds and, and think about, you know, this is a city we want to see grow and we want to see grow well, uh, but we're not going to do that when there's so many regulatory barriers to uh, cr producing new housing options that, the, and that variety of new housing options. I agree with all of you, and if I can just throw my two cents in, I think it's gonna take me and you. I think it's gonna take us educating ourselves and then educating our peers, and then making a stand and showing up and taking action. So I would like to thank all of you for being here again and for showing up as taking action for the first time. And thank you all so much. Very good. Uh, for, especially I'm thinking Brett, because you're working in government affairs. I don't, and I don't know if this is your expertise, but can any speak to what's coming up in this legislative session where we might be pushing at the state level? Brett, you kind of mentioned that, but is there anything that's coming in at the state level that we can then go to our legislators and tell them, watch for, if we support this kind of density? Yeah, so, um, Last year there was an ADU bill. Um, Washington State Legislature works on, works on biennium, so anything that was introduced in 2019 is reintroduced in 2020 if it didn't pass. Uh, there was an ADU bill that, that was introduced in 2019. It was kind of overrun by um, a bill called House Bill 1923 that provided some SEPA reform um, and created some exclusions. Um, I think that's going to come back uh, again. I think um, there's going to be a bill around zoning, actually, that, that mirrors House Bill 2001 in the state of Oregon this year um, that opened up single-family zoning to duplexes and triplexes. Um, and if nothing more creates a conversation, uh, I think that's going to be really important uh, just to build that conversation. Uh, and I think there's even some potential for some bipartisan support on that. Um, You'll see a bill that does a little cleanup on the Condo, uh, Condo Liability Act. Um, what else do we have? It's a short session, it's only 60 days. Um, and I think, you know, quite honestly, the, the biggest issue that the legislature is going to face is how do they fill the transportation funding gap. Um, that's that's a, just a massive issue that the legislature has to figure out that affects trains, planes, and automobiles in this region. Um, so that's a really that's a really critical issue, I think. You know, especially as as we continue to grow with the need for more housing near transit stations, um, and we have this uh, proposal uh, to and we voted to support uh, a large expansion of light rail, um, but we've got to commensurately build those uh, those affordable housing units near that light rail those light rail stations. How does the um, community for affordable housing work with or parallel to the Washington Low Income Housing Institute and the Housing Development Consortium? Oh, you're getting, um, given, uh, we are, we're, a, we're a fairly small bunch uh, and we're all volunteers. So uh, we've worked with uh, HDC and attended their events and uh, interacted with some of their members on policy solution conversations. Um, uh, that has been part of what those brainstorming uh, events that I was mentioning with uh, State Representative Ryu have been around. Um, but we have, sort of have limited bandwidth because we've got day jobs and night jobs too. Um, but you know, clearly the housing, we're very firm believers in, uh, that our housing ecosystem, our rental challenges are connected to our home ownership challenges. They're all interrelated. about the opportunity zones and if you guys are looking into that or being looking
I'll, I'll take that one. So <clears throat> one of the firms that I'm involved with, uh, Equity Street, we're working on an opportunity zone right now. In fact, it was funny that Troy, you said the land of Oz down there in Soto because that entire area is opportunity zone. There are some challenges with that. Um, I, I think it got a late start because the IRS took its time to get out exact uh, rules and regulations around it. There is still, I believe, some, I think there's one new building that's coming up that is going to be middle market housing now in an opportunity zone. I think it's around uh, just south of downtown, uh, not fully in DeSoto, but uh, there are possibilities down there. I think part of it is still zoning, that there's, uh, most of it's still industrial, it's not zoned for housing, so that's a huge challenge. Uh, the other challenge is honestly, uh, it's just one of the marketplace. You've got typically your your property owners now who instantly, as soon as that, oh, my, my property is in an OZ. Oh, and those people, there's gonna be people pouring in to buy my property, therefore now I want double what I was asking before. So it's it's been challenging even finding properties where the numbers will pencil, and that's with the added tax benefits on top of it. So if you want to know more, come see me and we can talk more, but it, it's it, it's not a magic pill by any means. And we saw that escalation in land acquisition cost in related to TIP districts as well, uh, uh, where um, it made that value of that land pencil up and then you added on uh, that cost, the, the housing that was being redeveloped in the Midwest in those districts, the pricing structure was too high.